Right, I'm hopeful. That means that we are yeah, live. It, says, it, says, it says on Facebook. Great. So I'm just going to have a quick look and find us on Facebook as well so we can look at questions and we'll just wait for uh, people to join us. Excuse me while I am looking down. Right. Super, super, we just talk amongst ourselves. Well. Yeah, we'll talk amongst us. You talk amongst yourselves. No um, swearing though. Yeah, <laughs> live, not live on channel floor. Please do not say <laughs> any S or Bs. So we are live this evening to talk to you about lockdown. And um, you may have seen that the three of us of trainers have come together before. We did a nice little talk. Um, feels like quite a while ago now, doesn't it? Um, because we all share the same ethos in terms of how dogs should be trained and what we think a nice, perfectly balanced canine universe would look like. Uh, equally, we've all got our own take on how some of that should work or, you know, different ideas of how it should be. So um, thank you to all of those that are taking the time to join us. We're going to try and, and keep up with questions as we're going along as well as everything else. But first of all, we're just going to take two seconds just to say hi and introduce ourselves. So Emma, I'm going to let you do that whilst I uh, look down at the phone and see what's going on. Well, introduce me or introduce, introduce him. <laughs> Him. So, um, yeah, Emma Jane, Essex Dog Training. Um, yeah, I'm really excited about this, actually. It's a bit weird, but um, normally we're in the same room together. But, yeah, can't, can't wait to get going. Great. And, yeah, Paul Lasky, Dog Training. Hi, guys. Paul, a man of few words. Yep. Hello, three amigos. Amanda <laughs> said, hello, three amigos. Uh, and I'm Alicia of Alicia's Obedience Dog Training. Paul and I are, of course, the most... Um, what what we're going to say adventurous when we named our dog training clubs <laughs> <laughs> our names in the title so we thought we would put something together right there emma uh, yeah my calendar just fell down <laughs> live on facebook we know that there has been lots of changes to people's lives and them trying to cope with you know all bits and pieces that have been going on by the way if you see me look down i've got a phone here that i'm trying to keep on top of your what you're um, saying at the same time. So we thought we would come together and speak to you about lockdown and we don't want to be uh, kind of negative Nellies about it, but equally we think we can help you now to prepare for kind of the other side and that there's definitely some things you could be putting in place. And we thought what better way to do that than to have a live session where you've got all three of us and you can glean information from us, okay? So we're going to split it into two halves. It's all lockdown related, but we're going to split it into two halves after having a bit of discussion. And the first thing that we wanted to talk to you about was about preparing for a change in routine. So we're reasonably sure that most of you, in some way, your routine may have changed, whether that's you've got children at home and you're trying to homeschool, whether you've been furloughed from work and you're spending more time at home, uh, whether you are now working from home and so you're at home more than you were before and you're not traveling to and from um, and if you are at home that you're out of the house less you know exercising and all the rest of it so we thought we would start to have a little chat about it and we'll open we had a nice question actually from Ellie so we'll open with Ellie's question then that'll get us chatting about it so Ellie popped on a question in the event and said that she's got a young puppy and when she goes back to work she wants that puppy to come to work with her but she wants to make sure that he's going to be able to cope with a train journey and then a street walk to her place of work how would she go about making sure that he's going to be able to cope with that now I'm pretty sure and I should have wrote down the time sorry Ellie um that it was like a 30 minute train journey and maybe a 30 minute walk or something like that it was quite a, a reasonable amount of travel so maybe you guys can start with your um, ideas on how she could start to prepare puppy for that when it goes back to normal. Paul, do you want to go first? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I would say, obviously, the, the train element is the harder element to, to emulate. Um, so we'll start with the easier element, which would be the, the walking. So you effectively need to get your puppy um, used to walking for half an hour um, and you would build up to that. Oh, just had a notification that I should have turned off. So you would, <laughs> you, you would build up to that 
gradually, because as we know, socialization um, is quality over quantity. But you do need to get your puppy up to the half an hour point where, where, they, where they can um, cope with a half an hour walk. Um, within that, you need, you really need the, the streets to emulate the streets that you're gonna be walking on to work. So you didn't, you didn't specify in the question, but if it's that um, you're getting off the train, was it, Alicia, was it train, uh, was it walk after train or walk then train? Yeah, so it was a train journey and then walking. So I, I, I think we can assume from that possibly that um, the, the walk is going to be in the, in the city. Yeah, I think um, sounds, that's what I've assumed, if I'm honest. Yeah, so you're, you're now looking, getting your puppy used to all the things that they are going to encounter on that city walk, if, if our assumptions are correct. So you're looking at um, buses, large vehicles, busy roads, um, people in suits, um, anything that anything that you can pinpoint is in your location where you work and where you're going to have to have that half an hour walk. You're effectively going to have to gradually get your puppy used to that. And I guess the the good news really is that you're you've got the time to do it at the moment. You've actually got the time to invest. It. Your life is not as busy, so you could look at um, YouTube. And we're gonna we'll probe to we'll. We'll cover this on the socialization part as well. But you could look at YouTube for all of the sights and sounds that um, are going to, to emulate those sights and sounds um, out in the city. Um, I don't want to waffle on too much, although I've got, I've got a whole page of stuff to say. So I'll hand <laughs> over to Emma. Um, we'll, we'll get some of Emma's ideas and then you can come back to me if you like. Yeah, it's quite weird, isn't it? Because I'm used to us butting in each other, but I'm also aware that if we do that, then we're not going to be able to hear each other. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a really good point. I think what we were talking about earlier is about preparation and is about planning. And the one thing that we all have time to do now is prepare. Um, maybe having a look at her local area to see what she can replicate. I mean, you've done all the fitting and, and you know the walking and everything else, but is she close by a station? Would she be able to encounter that within her daily walk or maybe a short car ride you know so there are ways that we can socialize it and and I think it's really good that she's got that time now because she's not going to flood the dog and and overwhelm it with masses amount of experience so I think the fact that she's asking that question is actually fantastic because she's already in that preparation stage as well so yeah, yeah, I think there's, um, from my point of view, there's lots of dogs that do this mm -hmm. on, a, on an everyday basis. So whether that's because they are, um, we were talking before, Paul and I, about this kind of police dog puppies and guide dog puppies. They, that's part of their training, isn't it? You know, to jump yeah. on a train or something and see, you know, start, sort of do that habituation of something moving. I think from my point of view, both great kind of um, advice from Paul and Emma. The only other thing that I would put in is if you can try and do a little bit about movement and noise. So you might not necessarily have like a wobble board or something at home, but if you can set up a slightly unstable ground, uh, whether it's just, you know, a rocking plank or a, a piece of flooring that kind of moves to and fro like a little rocking board, something like that. I think getting puppy used to being able to sustain because we also forget just how much pressure that puts on joints and muscles and he'll need to get used to, I'm assuming it's a he, uh, he'll need to get used to being able to kind of hold his core and just hold those muscles and not be frightened by the fact that something's moving and jiggling about. So just add movement to your list. But hopefully, Ellie, we have given you some... Um, Can I just advice. say one thing there, Alicia, oh, as well? <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, I wonder if she could maybe get in contact with her work to see once she's done a little bit, whether she could actually go up for, for just a couple of hours, maybe not in rush hour or something like that as well. Great idea. Yeah, Great other idea. things that you could, if you're going to emulate, I keep using the word emulate, but if you're, if you're going to recreate motion, um, obviously the car, it's, it's not a train and the context is completely different, but it is motion. And you would you could at least do a little bit of car training, um, other things that might anything that really emulates um, motion. So elevators is another one. Um, treadmills. Get get creative with it and see what is yeah. at your disposal 
And the more things you socialize the pup to, the more chance there is they're going to generalize that socialization to when you do eventually get on the train. Yeah, yeah it's building the confidence, isn't it? Definitely. Um, Elias posted and said, thank you very much, everybody. Um, people are uh, jumping on board and saying hi. So hello, everybody. I'm sorry I can't answer you all the same time. Um, I've dragged myself into the 21st century over the first few weeks. So we're just, you know, <laughs> winging it. But you're leading the way, Alicia. Look at this. We're, we're doing it. But I am trying to grab everyone's questions as they come through and make sure that we cover them. Um, one of the ones that have come up, Emma from Harvey's Dog Walking, has asked, She's at home currently, as is her husband. They've got a beautiful little chocolate poodle, but he's got quite used to their attention and he's doing a lot of kind of sitting in front of them and watching them. Now, I know um, Emma is a dog walker, so there are times when Harvey goes to work with her, but there are going to be times when he's going to be left at home or they're not going to be maybe home and available as much as they have been. So I think that's a beautiful question to lead us into preparing for that change of routine how it is now and how it's going to be um i don't know if you guys have got anything that's kind of burning for you to want to cover uh, emma shall i come to you first this time <laughs> um, i think it's probably since we locked down been my number one question that i'm getting kind of almost on a day-to-day -day basis on my webex classes and there's so many attention seeking behaviors that are going on at the moment, even from my own dogs as well. So they're kind of used to us being around. Um, and, and I think one of the things that we need to do right now, I actually started about two weeks ago when I was looking at my dog's behavior changing, is to get some time away from you, establish a routine. I think it's much better to kind of not walk your dog maybe once a week for work for a day and do some mental stimulation work. And then they go out for their walk on their own without the dog so, so that you get that, that time away, which it, it does actually really stop the attention seeking behavior because they're like, oh, I'm, all of a sudden I'm pleased to see. It. And that's whatever the attention seeking behavior is. Yeah, for sure. Paul? Yeah. so. This is, this is something that I do bang on about. Alicia and Emma would have heard me bang on about this. Um, if the puppy is staring at you, you know, one of the reasons that puppies stare at us is because most of the things in their life that are good come from us. Love, Harvey's affection. An old dog, but yeah, same, same. How, how old? Sorry, I, I thought I heard oh, six months. Gosh. Emma, how old is he? maybe uh two or three years old i think we'll see okay. does she do a lot of training alicia sorry does she do a lot of training does she do a lot with her dog uh yeah so emma loves her dog he is yeah. her world and they are doing agility and competing agility and done really well so she's invested a lot of time but i think yeah. equally with them being at home and him being a miniature poodle he's obviously very switched on uh, yeah. so he wants to be doing a lot but I, I think had the, it's the mirror same for puppies as it is for dogs that want yeah. to be on the go all the time, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. That's what I had with Kit, wasn't it? Go on, Paul. Sorry. Yeah, the the answer is is the same. It doesn't just a, apply to puppies. Um, so just teaching He's your four. dog. He's four. Okay, fine. So teaching the dog that um, to switch off from you. Um, so the, you're, you're effectively teaching the dog that something good can come from somewhere else in the room. So um, first of all, you would have your, your cue for interaction is not available. So your, your, the humans are not available now, cue um, or signal. Um, and then you could have, obviously the dog doesn't particularly know what the word means yet. Um, potentially, I don't know, you may have a, a word like break or, um, but I'm talking specifically for a word that ends, ends all interaction and the dog has to go and be a dog for a bit. Um, you can have a visual cue, which is much better. And this does, this is why this feeds into separation anxiety. A lot of the sort of classic separation anxiety behavior modification plans um, have that stimulus of you pick up and read a book or something like that. So in, a, in our world, we, you know, phone, tablet, book, magazine, something that's a, a very visual cue um, that the human is not available now, 
paired with something nice like a final treat, which you throw away from you. So the room delivers the treat effectively, not you. Um, and then you ignore the dog. And I think that's, that's really, for me, that's very important that your dog understands. If your dog doesn't understand that interaction is not available in your house, then how is, how is it going to understand when you leave the house? It's going to be even more traumatic. So the, I would say the first rung on any separation anxiety ladder um, is to just get your dog used to not interacting with you in the house. Um, and one strand of that is having a nice verbal and visual cue for the human is not available now. We had um, two questions that I think relate to this, if I'm honest. And um, one is, I think she's six or seven months old puppy. And the other one is a younger, um, I think he's a Cocker Spaniel or a Springer Spaniel, but he's a Spaniel. That's the important bit. Uh, Yay. So one, was, one was from Regina and she's got a Spaniel and he's very obviously switched on dog. And so he's doing a lot of um, barking at her when play and interaction is over. And then we also had a question from Georgina who said that her dog has started nipping at the end of playing. So I think both of those relate back quite nicely, don't they, to our dogs have just got used to us being around a lot more, following us around the house. You know, also, if you let your dog into every part of your house, my dogs have one of the house. Um, they might have even got used to following you to every single room. And, you know, you're not the sort of person that really closes doors. And I think you're right, Paul, in, I use a finished cue. If I do anything with my dogs, whereby I ask them to train or use their brains, I'll always stick a few treats on the floor and say finished. And then I'm not available. Um, and I try to do that whilst I'm working from home a lot more. You know, we're, we are as trainers with dogs all working from home a lot more than we would. I'm trying to do that uh, at every kettle break. So if I go downstairs and pop the kettle on, I'll ask them to, you know, let them out for we ask them to do some quick bits and pieces. But actually at the point that I make my cup of tea, I've then chucked my treats on the floor and said finished. And then I take my cup of tea and I come back and sit myself down with a book at work, you know, um, on my phone, whatever the case may be. But then it is enduring that I am not available. And we know that dogs will create behaviours to try and get our attention. And if we give them attention from those behaviours, those behaviours become reinforcing. So it is trying to. And I think the hardest thing is when you're at home with a super cute dog that's looking at you, we all love a bit of procrastination, don't we? And we all love a lovely distraction. And it's really hard not to go, hey, what are you doing? What do you want? Uh, whereas actually we do just need to give them a break. I think, if I'm honest, some dogs are going to breathe a sigh of relief when lockdown <laughs> everyone does like, oh, exercise more than ever they're here all the time interrupting my sleep because usually I sleep for you know at least a good part of the morning or part of the day um and I think all of us know that relaxation settling having time out on their own and sleeping is very important I also think if I can just add to that as well, say, obviously I've got three dogs and the one of mine that absolutely struggled the most was the one that I do the most with. So obviously that was Kippy, you know, we were ready to go over to Belgium. His brain was switched on, he was switched on to me. He was super fit. Um, and I actually had to go through a real calming down procedure with him I, I, we spent lots of time apart he was following me from room to room throwing himself in the bath and, and gradually kind of just getting himself into all sorts of trouble so I actually did did no training at all for a week I did everything that I did with him with stuff that I never do which was interaction away from me we had like butter pots and actimels and like the empty bottles and putting treats and putting that away from me so that he could snuffle and just break that communication with me. And kind of gradually I, over the last couple of weeks, I've also got into getting up on time and he's going back into his bed area. And when I'm working, he doesn't spend time with me all the time. Um, and that's kind of really, really helped to, to just switch his brain on. And now I'm doing the, the mental stimulation and, and we're getting a nice balance. So definitely if she's done lots of work, um or, or even with a puppy that's biting you know away from you with with stuff that they can do snuffle mats all that sort of thing is, is a really good attention thing yeah. um, your cardboard box alicia 
it's yeah. brilliant isn't it um, so I love a bit of recycling or at least uh using my shredders before I hit the recycling so uh, on our page on the Alicia's obedience dog training page we shared this week a photo uh, and I introduced this to all of my puppies at week one in puppy class usually we try and give them a toilet roll with a, a treat in while we do the talking bit at the end so it keeps the puppies busy they don't get bored but it actually gives them something to do so one of the things you do need to think about is when your routine changes, your dogs are going to be bored. They're definitely going to be bored. Some of them are going to breathe a sigh of relief and rest. But even after a few days, they're then going to start to wonder, you know, why buttons shut? Because they've had all of this entertainment and suddenly it's disappeared. I think you need to be realistic about <laughs> buttons and, and shut. And find out. Um, you know, think about what you're going to do about it and what are the things that you can utilise when you're not about. Now, recycling with big brown boxes is perfect, giving those to your puppies or your dogs. You know, I know lots of older dogs that love still to destroy things because they can do that when you're not there. It doesn't really matter. They're not going to get themselves into trouble. You know, you can crack on. There's lots of... And you're going to have a camera on them anyway, probably, hopefully, although we'll talk yeah. about that in a second. Exactly. So we're going to, you know, think about all the things that we can safely leave those dogs with that can keep them busy. But actually, sometimes we need to teach them to do nothing. And I think that's the bit that we're all picking up on is that teaching your dog to do nothing is, is an important part of training. So, you know, whether you then use a settle mat, or if your dog's been used to sitting on the sofa with you, you know, if you're working on the sofa on your laptop and your dog's sitting next to you on your lap the whole time or by your feet, actually one of the first things you can start to do is start to get them to settle away from you. And teaching a settle to a mat or an area is the perfect way to do that. So they start to learn to be independent of you. And if they get up and wander off, let them, you know, don't kind of be on top of them the whole time. Um, let them kind of go off and do their own bits too. I think that leads quite nicely in as well. Um, I was chatting to somebody yesterday and they were saying, you know, it's kind of common, common thinking, isn't it? That, oh, you know, they're walking their dog more and they were hoping that that would wear, wear them out more. But what I was actually saying, what they're actually doing is building up an athlete, particularly if they're doing lots of street walking, you know, if they're walking quite quickly, that is actually improving fitness, which means the more they walk their dog, the more walks that their dogs are gonna need. So yeah, of course, walk your dog, keep them fit, but but by walking, you know, if, if a member of the house is like taking that dog out and it's going out four or five times a day, then actually that could be increasing the blood pressure and increasing the fitness as well. So yeah, yeah. sure. Um, I think it's important that we touch on crates and puppy pens and baby gates and doors because I know there's a real split isn't there with some people that we support that aren't huge fans of using anything that confines their dog or their puppy. I think you need to start thinking about where is your dog going to be left if you're not in the house and is it safe? It isn't always safe to give your puppy or dog lots of space. And actually not all dogs like lots of space. Some of them want to have somewhere that feels a bit more secure. And I would start to introduce them to that place now whilst you're about in the house. You know, you can see them potentially at the same time. So you're sitting there on your laptop, let's say, for example, working and they're the other side of a gate or a door, you know, busy settling on their mat with a chew or something to do because that's going to give you two heads up. One's going to be, can they cope with that now whilst you're in the house? And I know some dogs find that tough. Uh, some dogs actually cope better when you're not there, but it's nice for them to be able to be away from you, even if you're in the house. Uh, and the other thing's going to be deciding whether that's the right place to have them, whether you've actually chose the right room. Um, one of the questions that's come up whilst we've been chatting is about a dog that's barking in the night. And one of the first things I always look at if I go out to a dog that's barking in, in the night is where is it near? Is it near the back door? You know, is it near an alleyway you know, on an external wall? You know, is there things that's disturbing that dog? Foxes are the bane of my life. Um, <laughs> in people and it's kind of breeding season, isn't it, at the moment? So, um, yeah, I don't know if you guys have got anything more to add to that in terms of confinement and safety and uh, kind of arousal during nighttime, settling overnight. Yeah, um, well, you've, you've really just hit on a, a huge point there that logistics is key. Um, and sometimes, as much as all three of us are dog trainers, sometimes good old trial and error will give you the answer. So I've had... Um, 
separation, mild to be honest, but mild separation cases where it's just been um, solved by changing the room, um, giving the dog a perch where they can see out, or in some cases the opposite, removing the visual outside. Um, so yeah, I'm, I am a fan of um, using space. I would, I would describe all of this as using a space as, as management. Um, it's just management. And if you, if you positively associate those management tools, then there's not a problem. And obviously using trial and error, you might find a place where the dog is already positively associated and hey, presto, you don't even have to do any training. You've, you've already got the answer there. So yeah, um, crates, dens, baby gates for um, having the dog near you, but with a barrier is often kind of the second or third step um, in a behavior in a separation plan where you or not not just in a separation plan but in if you're just haven't got a problem and you're just building it up anyway um yeah so i i i i, I love all these management tools as long as you use them positively and as as management tools whilst you're doing some training on top um then yeah why not go for it Oh. I would also kind of add to that, say, as you know, guys, I, I tend to look at the, the whole big picture. So, yeah, you know, everything that you said for, for the actual problem, but kind of what is there something that's feeding that during the day as well? So are we if it's only if it's a new problem, is it that the dog's with them 24 seven during the day? so that then that's causing them to be more anxious at night. Little thing, if it's a puppy, is it getting enough feed? You know, you say sometimes pups are waking up because they suddenly need extra dinner or they're not getting that mental stimulation so they're not quite so tired. So kind of look at it in a really big picture as well. Yeah, yeah. perfect. Um, also, just, just to add quickly, reinforcement okay. at night. So are you is there something going on that's reinforcing the dog waking up? Are you are you waking up and having 20 minutes of tuggy with the dog? Because, <laughs> um, you know, that's a pretty obvious thing um, yeah. that would be reinforcing it. For, and I have had clients like that. And I said, have you just tried staying in bed? And <laughs> Put the earphones on. I, yeah. I get a text the next day. Bingo. You know, I, 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 I didn't move for three minutes and the dog went back to sleep. <laughs> I think it's it's really hard, um, but I try to adapt how I know um, all of my friends with children, because I don't have children, all of my friends with children kind of did night feeds, which is if your pup's, dis pup's disturbed in the night, get up, switch as few lights on as you can while safely making it around the house, offer them a toilet, Make sure nothing underworld's happened in the cray or pen or wherever you're sleeping them. Pop them back and go back to bed, you know, with as little interaction as possible so we haven't switched any of the brain on. Um, if they are really, really sad about being left, I'm not a personal fan of any cry out or distress. I would go, yeah. and see, you know, and I've done this, sat in my dressing gown next to a puppy crate with my back to it reading a couple of pages of a book or something or you know just not interacting but I'm there I can offer you reassurance and then once they're settled and asleep going off again I think absolutely it's really fast when we bring puppies home or any dog home you know if you've got to the point where you're at home and you're allowing your dogs on your bed because you don't really want to be disturbed in the morning if you're going to go back to work and ask them to sleep in another room again then you need to start doing that now in fairness to them so that they can get used to it um, yeah, particularly. Yeah. Sorry, Alicia. And um, yeah, no, I was just going to say, particularly, you know, is it? I I don't know about you guys, but I'm actually calmer than than I've been for a long, long time. You know, my sure. my morning is is just like I'm pretty laid back. And of course, when we go back to 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 work, we're all going to be kind of back up there again. So our stress levels are going to be, I think, much higher. And um, just just tuning into the barking, and it, it's not so much overnight, but I had one. Um, a, it's a little cockapoo puppy the other day that's been barking a lot um, and the, the lady openly um, had a chat with me that, that her anxiety, she suffers from depression and anxiety and her anxiety levels are absolutely through the roof at the moment because of everything that's going on really and, and we're pretty sure that, that that's a really big trigger for the dog because, because they don't do particularly well with emotions and stress either do they so again try and sort of look at the whole picture. No, I think that's a really good point. I think on both counts, both the fact that I know ordinarily um, I'm up and out most mornings and I know 
that I'm way less stressed than I usually am because I'm not rushing around and chasing my tail. You know, I've never been at home so much. But I know equally for some people, this is a really stressful um, and anxious time because of the uncertainties and whether it's work or money or just everything that's going on. So, yeah, I think that's a really nice point to um, to jump on to, actually, Emma, just to, to be realistic about those things that are going on. Um, I'm going to give us one last point just around uh, leaving our dogs and building new routines and getting them set up. So we've had a message in from a lady that's got a seven month old puppy and before lockdown, they've got it in a beautiful routine and it was happy being left alone and was coping really well. They've tried this week, they've popped out, watched it um, on a camera or video or something and realised that actually the puppy barked the entire time that they were out. So. Um, I think all of us would say technology is great. We're currently using Zoom to speak to you live on Facebook. And this is a brilliant app. If you've got anything you can set it up with indoors, you know, any technology at all, I would just old make mobile sure. phone. Yeah, an old mobile phone, a laptop, an iPad. There's so much that you can use. But I would just make sure you switch the sound off. I'm not a fan of talking to dogs when you're not there. Um, and ideally, you need to be coming and going little and often. I, again, the same as I would say overnight. I don't I wouldn't want anyone to leave the house and watch a dog howling and wait for it to be quiet to go back because actually that distress escalates now whether that's a, a fear of being left or whether we would label it as separation anxiety or whether it's just you know a little bit of FOMO fear of missing out my humans have gone off without me none of us are going to dictate what that is but I think your approach should be the same come and go come and go come and go get them used to being in other rooms you popping out um, you know, go and grab something out of the car, sit in the car and listen to a song, wash your car, uh, you know, all those bits and pieces that you can do outside, do a bit of work in the garden without your dog being with you. So you're going to build that up slowly, but steadily and reassuring. Make sure that dog's got something to do. Make sure when you go back in, you don't make a big deal about it. Um, you know, your returning will be exciting enough. Uh, and I think, you know, just keep. Did you say it was in a crate, Alicia? No, they didn't say whether she was crated or not. So, so either even if you know put it in an area or, or it's crate when yeah. they're just washing the floor you know just to get that that little bit of anything just to get that little bit of separation isn't it i go with. back probably to if you are going to crate uh, or pen a dog then and you haven't used it a great amount because you've been home i'd probably go back to feeding meals in feeding there it, well. yeah so definitely really nice positive associations getting or, or dropping sprinkling treats through the roof through the top yeah. Um, um, I'm a, a fan of that's grated what cheese I usually that, yeah. a fan of what grated cheese <laughs> Lovely. Perfect, for, perfect for sprinkling uh, of course you can use their own food but if you want to give them a nice treat right can so, I just add one thing of course. <laughs> I love it Paul go on be naughty <laughs> no so when I said um you're in bed and you just ignore the dog uh, as Alicia said I am not a fan of controlled crying because if the dog is distressed, you need to help the dog. Um, and I've, you know, I've even seen dogs hurt themselves on the cages, as, uh, on, on the crates as well, if they get that distress. So I'm not saying leave your dog while it gets distressed. I'm saying if you think it's a slight reinforcement problem, you could try ignoring it for a couple of minutes. That's I, I think there's a distinct difference, though. And I think most people, it doesn't take a dog trainer to know the difference between a tiny little attention cry. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think some can be quite similar. In I think they, if they work out that a particular cry got your attention, then they're probably going to use that as an alert to get you. Um, Tasha, you're very welcome. Tasha says thank you. So I'm going to use a question that's going to bridge the gap from our um, being home and our changes of routines into socialisation and habituation, because I know we've all discussed that we've seen lots of posts and we've spoke to lots of people that are super worried that maybe their dogs or their puppies aren't getting the same socialization and habituation experiences that they're used to and how that's going to affect them coming out the other side of lockdown, whether that's going to be detrimental to them. But the first question that I'm going to use just to bridge the gap over uh, is a feeding question. And the question is that their dog has started to bark at them when they are preparing meals, the dog's meals, um, though I do also know a puppy that has started doing this when they're preparing human meals and it's getting worse every time and they're not sure what to do about it. Uh, Emma, do you want to go? Yeah. 
I was trying to see where the link was to socialization there. So I think in terms of socialization and habituation for me, this is about a routine, isn't it? But equally, it's about a meal time and therefore them getting used to maybe the noise or the activity of feeding and yeah. the, the right process they should be offering you at that time. So uh, for, for me, I always look look at things, you know, what, what do I actually want my dog to do instead? You know, there's no point in saying to a dog, no, 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 because they don't actually get it. If you end up shouting at it, you're all shouting together. So whether you drop in treats as you're doing it, that could be a reinforcement, or if you're shouting it, then everything could be a reinforcement. So I would look at what I wanted my dog to do instead. Um, and I would build up, you know, settling on a mat, or I know some people that use these little tiny boxes, but, or even the little high beds are a really good thing. So I, I would kind of want a positive association with what I was doing, but I would need to train that away from the problem first so you know if you're just sitting on the sofa trying to get them to settle on a mat and things like that so that they had you know settling is a really good thing for the dog to do so yeah I, I would look at what they want the dog to do instead and train that and you've got to train it there's, there's no quick solution um, sorry, I'm laughing because I've just had a, a message that's making me chuckle on the page. So I will share it with you currently. Paul, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, it's, it's another one of my favourite subjects. Um, target uh, in the, the, the training thing that I use most to, to kind of solve this is tar getting the dog to target a mat with their body away from it has that has the extra benefit that the dog is, if the dog is a couple of meters away from the food, it's not gonna be so overstimulated that it can't think. Um, the distance between the dog and the food will just give the dog that extra bit of thinking time. Um, I also like that method because if you can get quite good at throwing, um, you, can, you can actually communicate with the dog that I will not go for your pot of treats unless you stay, if you stay on, if you, if you come off, I'll just put my hands behind my back. And within literally a few reps, you can normally get the dog going, oh, I'll, I'll go back. And then you need a good throw. Um, Paul, would you train say? that while, while the problem was there? Or would you do that? Like, would you set that up as a training? See, for me, I would probably set no, that up I, as I, a do, training I, experiment. I, I would do that in session. I'd, I would okay. literally say, I'd say, show me. Um, I would I'd say, prepare some food. Usually, yeah. no, yeah, in session. However, I see what I see where your question is getting out. I've had, I did have one particular Labrador pup that was just way, way overstimulated. Yeah. And with that pup, we had to go back. And this brings me on to my next point on the subject. With that pup, we went back. We we just binned off the the food training for a bit, and we taught the do the dog some basic self self control games. So if it is a problem and the mat the mat training is not um, solving it, then go back to basics with some more basic obedience, including some self-control games. And what I mean, usually start with is just the classic leave it of mm. back, off, back off to get it, basically. Yeah, away yeah, from yeah. the food bar with a really boring piece of food. Um, but I've only had that, you know, once or twice where the, the, the dog was just throwing itself at the counter and to the point where it was actually going to damage the people's lovely new kitchen. I was like, this isn't working. But generally, yeah, target... I'm, yeah, get, get I'm a great favourite in, um, in, in telling the dog what to do. Because <laughs> most, yeah. most of the time, we don't, you know, lots of people don't actually tell their dog what to do. They don't, if they were to say, yeah. actually say, sit, wait, yeah. most dogs probably would. I've had some um, real success. And actually, I'll be really honest, this is a method that I use with my own dogs and puppies when they come home. In um, And barking, I think, if we're being honest, is one of the more frustrating behaviours and the more difficult behaviours for people to manage because... You can train your mat settle, that dog can still bark at you. You can yeah, train yeah, your distance, yeah. that dog can still bark at you. Um, so I have a really obvious uh, kind of physical cue for my dogs. And that is that I ask them to sit and I start preparing food. And obviously I've taught that sit before and I've rewarded that behavior. And I'm actually not massively worried about the sit, but I am massively worried about four feet on the floor. And then if at any point they start bouncing up at me, barking at me, doing any behavior I don't like, I stop. I completely stop my process of preparing the food and I'll yeah. stand absolutely still until they give me the behavior I like. And it might be a fraction of a second of four feet on the floor and being quiet. 
and I'll just say that's nice and I'll continue then preparing the food and equally yeah. again if they don't do it um, exactly introducing a new puppy into a home with other dogs can be quite frustrating for those other dogs and you might have to think about how you're going to manage that at meal times if it isn't just one dog that you're trying to work with. Um, I have a particularly cute photo of my Matilda when Daphne was a tiny puppy and Daphne really struggled around meal times. She's very good at it now, but she was really struggling uh, where Matilda's actually got a foot on her towel as if to say, you will stay still because we do want our dinner sometime soon. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We have an added, an added favour there is always... Well, yeah, it, and, and it, it comes as back that actually we can reward and reinforce with movement and sound so much that it just becomes repetition, repetition, yeah, I'm just repetition. not going to continue until you give me something I like. Yeah. I, mean, I don't like yeah. being shouted at. I'm not going to keep preparing your food. You know, I genuinely, I wouldn't do that if I, you know... was. You I like the freezing. The snack. If you start shouting at me, I'm not going to carry yeah. on. Because so. you're, you're, the, the dog is what the dog's doing is tuning into your micro movements a lot of the time with your hands are on the counter fussing around with the food. And as soon as you stop they're you know, they're, they're going to learn that it's nothing available. And it um, is I just, exciting. It is, you know, mealtimes are exciting. Just like you said, Paul, control yourself. It's yes, the only thing that's exciting to, at the moment in my life. Isn't it? <laughs> dinner. I just wanted um, to add a caveat when, when I, no. when I, another caveat, <laughs> when I, when I said train a leave it, I wasn't talking about training your dog to leave the counter. I was saying train it, like just food, train man. it to just, just not even that, just train it to strengthen your dog's self-control muscle, um, to strengthen that thinking part of the brain that tells the dog, um, if you back off, you might get it anyway. Um, so you don't necessarily have to apply the leave it to the <laughs> counter situation. It's just some foundation work to, to kind of round off your dog's kind of um character that they can start to use their self-control muscle he's cool. getting out of control alicia he's getting out of control he's fine i'm, go I'm going to control myself we've had a question and i want to pop on this question because i know there's lots of people with lockdown puppies i think we've all seen a bit of a surge in puppies uh, whether that's just because people are a bit more concerned about how they tick that socialization and habituation box whilst lockdown and social distancing is going on um, but actually I know a lot of people with older dogs that are worried about the lack of socialization and interaction that their dogs are getting and whether that's going to affect them coming back into you know whatever normal life's going to be as it creeps in so we've got a question from Carl and he's got a large Malamute Mal um, I've seen him he's beautiful Lovely. And he said that he socialises him with some other dogs. They all kind of meet up as a group and they socialise and they all got used to, you know, each other and who was where kind of, you know, if we want to talk, talk about a pecking order of some kind and they knew one another. His question is, when all this ends and they meet up again, is he going to remember that information that he had from those other dogs before this happened? 100%. Oh. Yes, but you could have a quick refresher where everyone just goes for a lead walk so that the dogs don't get overstimulated and too impulsive at seeing each other for the first time in two months. Yeah. They'll be um, like us three. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> parallel <laughs> walking. You. Parallel walking on a lead. Um, just until all the dogs are calm and then you know you might do that a couple of times or you might even feel comfortable enough to just quietly unclip the leads if you're if they're off lead group um, but yeah I would just just go back into it slowly just for those first few minutes yeah um, I think I'm completely with both of you so yeah my thought Emma was yeah of course you know it's like meeting old friends isn't it they're going to bump into one another and know uh, but absolutely bang on Paul I think just watching out for over arousal you know that initial excitement that everyone's back together and maybe there's this ton of energy if it's an open space they've not been to for a while um i know these guys in particular frequent a local woods that's closed at the moment and that's likely where they're going to meet again um and i think being able to get over there without his friends for a couple of times and have a bit of a blast and maybe a burn mm. off the, yeah good idea get used to all of everything else in the environment would be a good shout too I think it's brilliant that he's talking about going back to the dogs that, that yeah. were his friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His friends. Tippy and, and my dogs bumped into a spaniel up, up at our park the other day that Tilly, that, that Stacey trains. They were so chuffed, so chuffed. They immediately knew her. 
Um, I'm going to be like that. I've been over a park and bumped into a couple of friends that have got three dogs that are really good friends with my dogs. And even at a distance, they were like, I think that's my mate over no, there. You. Oh my God, it is. <laughs> uh, I think it's lovely, isn't it? It's so nice. Um, hey, right. we finally linked it into socialization. Yes, back to socialization. Told you, didn't I? Uh, so I've got a question from a puppy owner whose um, puppy was after, you know, post vaccinations going out and about. But since, and at that time, uh, so Chanel's a puppy, at that time, the puppy was already a little bit nervous, unsure of people and would bark at people. And so they're concerned now there's been a reasonable period of time where she hasn't had that interaction. Is that going to be worse than it was before? And is there anything they can do to help her out in the meantime to try and make sure that it isn't? Can we find, do we know, has it been, has it been barking since it's been quieter out? Because we were talking about this earlier, weren't we? That actually when we have, separation and sorry when they have social coming life. into their house sorry it's what? That bit. it was people coming into their house more than uh, anything and obviously yeah. nobody's been coming round it depends it depends why the dogs barking um is it is it fear or or is it just the 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 schnauzer breed trait as well um what, what was the what was the actual question, Alicia? Uh, the question was that she was barking and unsure of people before. How can we help her, and is that going to be worse? Um, people coming over, in my experience, is one of those where it's it's quite. I quite like these cases because it's quite easy to control. It's in the house. Um, if you've read my my blog on on this kind of case. Um, we have the the dog on lead with the owner taking high value treats um, in the kitchen. Bring the person in, sit them down because that's much less um, arousing than somebody walking through the front door and walking down the hallway. Then you bring the dog in. So that's kind of the the standard protocol we would use for bringing people in the house. Um, but yeah, the, the the problem is even in non lockdown, these behaviour cases, people don't have enough visitors to practice the, the the principles of it in enough anyway so it can be quite a slow burner um so i would say as long as as long as you follow that protocol that you obviously if you're worried that she's gonna have to put this caveat in as well um if you're worried that she's she's going to bite someone um then you need to obviously call a behaviorist and have them over um maybe we'll, we'll give a little note at the end where to find behaviorists alicia yeah, we can um, do that with Adeline. But, but effectively, the, the first step is to get the person in the house and sitting down and then bring the dog in on the lead and give them high value treats. Um, ask the people to ignore, just to talk to you, start chatting as friends, or whatever you'd normally do, and you'll see the dog calm down fairly quickly. In most cases, again, if the dog is not calming down, it would be good to get a behaviorist over. So in, in, in answer to your question, um, I, I wouldn't worry about it too much because it is a slow burner. And as long as you're sometimes, sometimes less experiences that are all positive is better. So you could go, you could go six months with say six visitors, one visitor a month. And if all of those experiences are mega positive, which they will be if you do it in that way, um, you've suddenly got a dog that's gone six months with zero stressful encounters in the house with strangers and six really positive ones and quite low stress levels in the house if, if in the absence of other problems. So um, yeah, it's a slow burner, follow that protocol um, and don't worry about the, the frequency too much. Yeah. I would yeah. also wonder how much interaction it got with people when it was out of the house. So, you know, if it is just, you sometimes, you know, that situation may not be arising outside. So you don't actually know whether it might just be fearful of people, in which case the what we're experiencing now, the, the distancing is absolutely amazing. And, and yeah. you know, even kind of neighbours just dropping in treats over the fence and things like that could help, couldn't it, as well? I don't think it's an uncommon issue. You know, we know lots of dogs that are better outside than inside, better off lead than on lead. And so it's about those decisions and the abilities they've got to make. I think this is an ideal opportunity for you to do a little bit of dress up, actually. And uh, particularly if you've got the potential to stick What are you dressing up in, Cole? Different, different hats. Uh, 
It, Saturday oh. was yesterday. Sorry. <laughs> Only um, on Saturday nights. We spoke in particular, one of our ladies has got a dog that is um, really adverse to anything that's, you know, like the work jackets, the fluorescent jackets, just goes absolutely ballistic at anyone that's wearing them. So, uh, you know, I would start to see, is there, can you can you put on different guises? You know, it's a bit like, um, is it look who? Uh, have they got glasses? Have they got different coloured hair? Have they got a hat on? Do they have a coat on? Can they see their face? Uh, and then you know be able to kind of work towards is it just you know reinventing that habituation about seeing lots of different things and people which leads us on to the next question which is should I get my dog used to people wearing masks yeah what masks oh yeah definitely definitely I would train my dog in a mask actually that's something I haven't done I will probably do that yeah, I think it's a brilliant question because we don't know as it stands whether that's going to become some kind of guidance, but there are already lots of people out there. And when we've spoke about being able to tick the socialization box, Paul, one of your uh, magic tricks for socialization was um, shopping. So, you know, taking them to the car park of the shopping center and getting them used to seeing people. And I stole that from someone else. Oh, did you <laughs> find all that, all those Blatant. that are going on? But actually, there's lots of people now, isn't there, with gloves and and uh, masks on so yeah I think if you've got a dog of any age it's the same for me as when um kind of Halloween and Christmas and fancy dress and all those sort of things come to mind is that yes if people wearing masks it's going to be one of the things that your dog has to uh, be able to see and cope with and thinks a good thing then yes you should be getting them used to some masks sure. I actually think as well I'd like to add, add I know we were chatting about it earlier that actually you know we've seen an influx of social media posts just recently of people being really really worried about it and I think that the calmer they can be I, I think you know the last thing we want to do is take on cases of, of traumatized and and actually just just chill out because because sure. none of us actually know what's going to happen because we haven't been in this situation before and, and just just kind of calm and and just just gentle exposure is far better anyway you know this is kind of, yeah. us trainers scream out for this situation on socialization don't we yeah i think that's a, a good point for us to cover at right now is that i think lots of people are worried that their dogs are missing out on socialization and habituation there's loads that people can be doing but actually and probably the three of us and there's more trainers out there for sure this is a scenario that if we could have manufactured before yeah. now, we would have done. Because yeah. over socialization, the wrong socialization, making dogs, you know, far too gregarious are cases that we have to pick up every day of the week because people wrongly are um, kind of tricked into thinking that socialization means interaction. Now, we've had this discussion as a bunch of trainers. We're not saying that no interaction is great. We appreciate that some interaction needs to take uh, place and that needs to be positive. And positive means your dog enjoys it, not just that you've done it. Um, but that not having those over gregarious interactions is actually probably going to benefit. Uh, and, and we've kind of cited Emma to do a little study on this. It's probably going to benefit quite a lot of dogs. So as a, as a bunch of trainers, we know that you've got work to do, but we're really interested in thinking, actually coming out of this, you may have some of the best mannered dogs over the park and not be kicking yourself that lockdown happened. You, you know, you might actually benefit from it. I don't know if you guys have got anything of your thoughts to add to that, but I will just let you know we've got five minutes. Oh no! Yeah. <laughs> um, this is, this is my, probably one of my favorite uh, sound bites of socialization. Um, teaching your dog to not say hello is more important than teaching your dog to say hello. If you think about it, when you leave the house, your dog is not interacting with probably 80, 90% of the people that it sees and dogs on the street, especially. So the dogs that think they have a right to say hello or get frustrated. A lot of reactivity cases are that look like aggression are actually frustration because they can't say hello. Um, to bolt on top of that, the socialization that you do do, a lot of that can be done from a distance. So, and within that, a lot of the things that you 
you're going to socialize your dog too your dog actually shouldn't be interacting with motorbikes lorries um buses old ladies whatever if you've got a you know 60 kilogram dog so teaching your dog to not say hello is as important if not i would say more more important um realizing that socialization can be done from a distance and some of it like i say is, is not actually you you um emma said i was told me off for using a big word but some of it is habituation which basically means we want the thing to become part of the background like your washing machine very quickly your dog becomes habituated to the washing machine hopefully in as much as it's a thing that makes a noise it's not important um if you want to give another example livestock you want your dog around livestock, but you don't particularly want your dog paying attention to the livestock. No. Um, so when it, you boil it down percentage wise, it is a very small percentage of scenarios where your dog is going to be full on interacting with the thing, whether it's person, thing, dog. Yeah. So teaching your dog to not say hello and I'll hand over to Emma. Yeah, Emma, I'm actually going to ask you a, a slightly different wave on that question because we've had somebody say that they've got a dog that's just over six months old and it's going to doggy daycare twice a week to socialise. Do we think that is a good thing? No. Sorry, you want me to expand on that, don't you? I mean, I think it would be helpful. Okay, so um, do I think it's a good thing? No, because they're not there, so they can't read the dog. I think people need to be reading dogs. So we've spoken about this time and time again. When I say no, I mean, if it's a mass of dogs in a room together, then no, I don't think it's a good thing. We know that lead frustration is generally caused by, well, not always caused, but it can be caused by dogs that are put into massive groups together during the week and then the owner tries to walk so the dog's then frustrated on the lead and is then barking and barking and barking if the dog is in you know we're, we're under like lockdown so the, the socialization is quite low key at the moment and in my opinion by putting it into a big pack to go and play could be overwhelming so it could be overwhelming it could be flooding the dog um that's just I'll, my opinion. I'll, I'll add to that if could could is could is the operative word. Um, could. So if you if you sense that your dog is struggling with coping with frustration, you don't want to let it fester any further. Um, so at that point, you could go back to doing some get a trainer in, get a behaviourist in, um, go back to doing some good old frustration tolerance games. Um, and ultimately, as, as much as um, a lot of clients don't believe me, sometimes if you can see the lead frustration or the, the just general levels of frustration get coming, you know, or even manners and boundaries and things like that, it might be the time to just take your foot off the gas with the daycare, do some obedience training, do some frustration games, uh, and then see where your dog is in a few months' time. And it's probably some um lovely daycare owners watching this that uh um would would disagree uh, so yeah i think we have to just put on that it, it's some dogs so if your dog yeah. if you're worried that your dog has frustration issues then daycare is one of your daily routines that might need changing yeah i was just gonna say that i think it's really hard you know we can't um i know some fantastic daycare and I, I know some not so great daycare and I know the amount of dogs makes a difference. and I know the dogs that attend on those occasions make a difference. So I think, you know, we can't give blanket advice in terms of your dog and your daycare. If you think that your daycare is ticking your dog's socialisation box, I would question what do you think they're getting out of it? What boxes do you genuinely think they're ticking? And equally speak to your daycare owner and ask them, what are they providing your dog as socialization and habituation? Um, remembering that your puppy should be limited in terms of exercise because of its age and that it should have times to settle during the day. Uh, it may come home exhausted. That's not necessarily a good thing. Um, right, I'm super aware that we <laughs> are up against the time, but I, we've got two questions and I really want to answer them really quickly. And I know there are some others, but this hits our... Um, I'm happy to run over. Yeah, it doesn't bother me either. Here's the first one. 
The first one is when I'm introducing my pup to another dog, should I put a time limit on that? Yeah, I generally go for a three second rule to start with. You know, so, so I would never go for a head to head with a puppy. Lots of people will say that their dogs are fine with puppies when actually that they're, they're not quite fine. So generally I would say, I would not, first of all, you're teaching your dog to go up to another dog. So when that dog comes off lead, that's what you've trained it to do. Yeah, so I would basically walk alongside, couple of seconds, snip, turn away. Couple of seconds, snip, turn away. I love that. So in my training classes, we do that and I call it a high and a buy. So but you yeah. are going to pass dogs head to head and I want my dog to be comfortable passing head to head and I want them to acknowledge the other dog, but not necessarily interact with it if they do or don't want to and be able to walk away and that's when the fun starts. Um, I've got a feeling that this is a dog that is off lead and then going in and having a play with another dog and whether, you know, I wouldn't allow that on every occasion. I know Emma and I have had many discussions about this. I'd put it on long line straight away. Every occasion. Um, to protect the, the puppy. The amount of time, if they do play and it is nice play, so, you know, a bit of give, a bit of take, would you think about limiting how long that goes on for? Paul, do you want to put a bit on that? Yeah. So if it's a, yeah, if it's a known, a known dog, you, you, can, you can do a time limit. Um, which is fine, or you can do an observation time limit. So my rule of thumb, if, if you're starting to feel uncomfortable, the dogs probably are too. Um, so you're looking at, is one dog getting backed into a corner? Is it equal? Um, so brush up on your body language a little bit. Yeah, it's reading your dog, um, isn't it? Yeah, it, yes. It, it, really, my, my rule of thumb is if it looks like it's getting overstimulated, um, or there's a dog getting backed into a corner. You're, if you're feeling uncomfortable, just just pick up the long line, the management tool that Emma mentioned. Pick it up, take them away, have a breather. You might go back. You might have a few minutes away doing some training, and then let them back together. You can you can do some pretty sort of structured. If you're at your friend's house for the day or something like that, um, you could have the dogs in different rooms for a, a period of time, then back together. Um, so in, is the short answer to the, to the question, yes, um, have have time limits, but base it on information that the dogs are giving you. Yeah, I think I think I'm with you there, Paul, and I think I wouldn't allow my puppy to interact with every puppy. And that's because I'm really, really honest and I know I cannot be as fun as other dogs <laughs> into the nitty gritty of roughhousing or playing with other dogs. And if that's the sort of thing they like but equally understanding that that's where they hone some of their skills that I might not want them to use on the next dog that they greet. Um, I think, you know, we have to remember that our puppies are susceptible to injury and injuries can occur when they are rough and tumbling and, you know, being rolled about. And as much as that might look nice at the time, if you like the fact that your dogs are interacting, you won't think that if they've chipped a cartilage in their leg and you know everything goes on hold for a bit so yeah i think yes a time limit highs and buys not greeting every dog uh making sure that i would definitely pull my dog out if i thought the other dog was uncomfortable if my dog wasn't playing respectfully as well that's something can i can i just say that this this completely feeds back into the last question about the daycare um so to add to, to a slight more mitigation to our answer on the daycare if the daycare is somebody that has two or three different spaces puppy space, small dog space, nervous dog space, chill out space, and they know how to fluidly use those spaces throughout the day. Um, so really that, that question actually fits in really well with the last question. Yeah, I agree actually, um, yeah. And then, it's a, and then it's a very positive place. So you can, ask, um, you can ask your daycare owners the same questions that you would ask yourself, which is, do you know what to do if the dogs have a fight? Do you know what to do if the dogs get overstimulated? What, where's your chill out zone? How are you managing the space? And that's the same questions you would ask yourself when you're having your own dog mixing with your friend's dogs. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, one of the best setups I have to say that I've seen, and I'm not saying that I've been out and seen loads, um, was a lady called Charlotte who ran Bounce Dogs in Rittle. Um, I think she's had to close the daycare park really sadly. But she had that beautifully structured, exactly like that, small numbers of dogs, the dogs were well matched. She had different areas that she was able to manage those dogs in. And from my point of view as a trainer, that was a positive experience with somebody that was on top of body language and communication and was managing those dogs beautifully. 
Yeah, um, I think that is the key, isn't it? They need they need to be someone that is trained to, to read the dogs. Yeah, for sure. So the, the last question that we're going to take, and then we will do our quick top tips to end with. But the last question we're going to take is about having a puppy and introducing them uh, appropriately to an older dog. So there's a dog that already lives in the family home and you've just bought a brand new puppy home and we need to introduce uh, that puppy to the older dog. So some little um, kind of tips or, or anything that you've got to add to that. Um, oh, I, well, going. Go on, Paul. You, you can go first, Emma, go on. <laughs> no, we both like talking. Um, yeah, I yeah, we do, do. <laughs> slowly first. So generally for me, I would, if I, when I, well, in, when I introduced Kip, I, I took them out on a walk first. So, so basically I had him in my coat and we walked out first. Then we went in. Um, I, gave, I had both dogs had lots of time apart. So um, the, the puppy, because at that time, you, I, you know, I hadn't even trained that dog to be calm around other dogs. And I know that I had to be super careful with my bitch as well. So, you know, I generally I fed in the crate and that sort of thing so that I was managing time away. Um, and, and yeah, you know, I, I think it's, it's like anything, the calmer you are, the calm of the situation but it's knowing the older dog you know you should know what your older dog you know one of mine would be absolutely fine the other one i have to give a lot more time to so it's it's definitely knowing what the older dog's boundaries are going to be yeah um yeah I just it's really the same as the last the answer to the last question um manage your space know the dog's personalities observe when one dog is uncomfortable it might be the older dog it might be the younger dog um and i just call it it's, it's going to be quite a fluid situation so i call it musical dogs um you're constantly going to be massaging the dogs around the house it's depending on what's going on so oh puppy is tired needs to sleep older dog is bothering it or older dog tired needs to sleep puppy is bothering it and you might literally every 20 minutes half an hour or an hour you might be moving the dog into a different each dog into a different space in the house until you're at the point where they're they're equal and that could be equal size or equal confidence levels around each other um and you'll know you'll know when that point is and until then yeah. the most extreme example i had uh i had a daxi owner that kept the daxi in a different room in the house to the uh the 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 schnauzer because the schnauzer it, it was just looking quite predatory at times around the puppy and we just none of us felt comfortable and i i went there and said yeah i'm, I'm not comfortable just keep keep them in separate rooms um go on walks together like emma said and they didn't do anything more than that it was six months and i actually there's a pace, facebook post that they finally playing together and it took six months, but don't freak out. That's not the norm. No. Yeah, looking. we. I had the, the Yorkies when you decided to go on your holiday and, and I worked in your area and, and I had three Yorkies and, you know, we were really scared because the dogs were definitely giving this puppy some really bad vibes and we used stair gates and, and that sort of thing. And, and I think that took about, you know, a month or so to interact. But at the end of the day, don't risk anything. Don't no. ever risk anything. And if you need to use stair gates and that sort of thing, then then that's what you need to do. Time is completely on your side. These dogs are with you for the rest of their lives. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. There's no end result. No. And there's no rush to get to that, is there? Um, I'm a massive fan of using puppy pens for these scenarios and having both dogs be used to having time in the puppy pen. So they're kind of spending time together and they get to read one another and get to know one another, but they can't necessarily touch one another. Um, I met a couple of beautiful staffies, so an older staffy girl um, who we had to remind her of some of her past obedience training and do a little bit of work with her on calmness anyway, and a brand new uh, puppy staffy boy. And quite rightly actually in some cases she'd got really quite cross with the puppy because puppies are annoying and they've got sharp teeth and they do lots of really inappropriate stuff and they don't get body language like I'm trying to tell you not to do it and you're not taking the hint so I think that's where we need to make sure we are there as their advocates and, and help them to make better decisions but when they can't because puppies can't make good decisions at that point we need to be able to keep them safe because that had happened just over a few occasions, we had the same scenario, whereas actually older Staffy started to look as though she was just going to take a pop at him no matter what. 
um, and we did lots of settling both of them on beds you know away from one another in the same room one of them on a lead maybe if they needed to be on a puppy line or something and that worked beautifully and this and the same as you guys have kind of experienced that meant that they come together after that and and kind of got um got on rubbing along nicely uh right so let's do a little roundup we promised that we would give a top tip on lockdown so one top tip for lockdown uh, emma let's come to you first what's your top tip and one one you're on a strict one emma's gonna want to okay. read it's gonna be one keep calm <laughs> and don't read too many social media posts that are gonna panic you i love that yeah i've seen loads of them paul Socialisation is quality over quantity, and you can do lots of it at a distance. Excellent. Uh, and mine was technology is your friend. So make sure that you can view your dog when you aren't with it or it's away from you, even when you're not there. So you know what's going on. I've spoken to lots of people that uh, have got a vague idea, but don't definitely know. So um, we're going to round up at this point because genuinely the three of us would keep you here all evening quite <laughs> thoroughly chatting about dogs and everything to do i hope what we have shared with you are some great tips i know we've not come to everybody's questions uh, and there was definitely a couple on recall so um in terms of recall emma is your online recall course up yet um no it, it will, will be really in soon one of 24 hours give me 24 hours right emma's going to have a recall course online super soon um i've got a free pdf download on whistle pairing and training equally you can come to any one of us um if you need to discuss recall and maybe you know we can have a little bit of discussion about that at some point as well thank you so much for coming and joining us we thanks for keeping us control alicia you're welcome um, we genuinely just wanted to share some of our experience and knowledge with you to hopefully help you feel a bit more in control, set yourselves a little plan uh, and not panic, like Emma said, keep calm, don't panic. If I can remind you, you will not be doing yourself a disservice if you hop onto each of our pages and give it a like, because we all share some great information at different times. And I don't think this will be the last time you will see the three of us come together, whether that's uh, another live or online or whether that's in person. So uh, keep your eyes peeled and we will be back with you soon, I'm sure. OK, yeah. thank you very much for joining us. And we're going to sign off at this point And say oh, thanks, guys. Bye.